Failure is an essential component of life. It's only through learning what doesn't work that we can discover what does. Learning from mistakes first necessitates learning humility. We have to own our failures before we can benefit from them. This sort of pseudo-philosophical verbiage is all well and good in a motivational self-help book. But it was of little relevance to any wrestler sharing a locker room with the dreaded click circa 1995. No matter how over, how talented, or how many flames they had tattooed on their head, success or failure was strictly dictated by whether Sean Waltman let you have a good match, whether Shawn Michaels felt threatened by your ability, or whether you'd chauffeur the drunken squadron home. Failure, in other words, was seldom their fault, unless it was a failure to toady up to the power brokers calling the shots. I'm Gareth from What Culture Wrestling, and here are 10 wrestlers who blame others for failing in WWE. Number 10. Shane Douglas Blames the Click Shane Douglas returned to WWE in 1995 as the didactic Dean Douglas, a professor who planned to teach the roster a lesson. Unfortunately, nobody taught him how to avoid incurring the wrath of dreaded backstage faction, The Click. In his prior professional engagements with their members, Douglas had enjoyed a positive, even friendly, relationship. But that was when he, Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, and in particular Shawn Michaels, were still waiting for their big break. By 95, with the likes of Hogan shifted to make way for a new generation, it was a different story. Suddenly, Douglas was a threat. As the franchise told Hannibal TV, he knew something was up when Scott Hall asked him to work as snugly as he'd done in ECW, only to loudly complain in front of the boys in the back the very next day. Michaels had similar tricks up his sleeve. During a dark match in Valparaiso, Indiana, HBK repeatedly tried to rib Douglas by bumping on his back at the slightest of contact. Behind his back, the click would constantly whisper into management's ear about Douglas's ineptitude, ensuring those in power knew he was overrated. His time in the company soon ended, and he'd never return. Number 9. Mr. Kennedy Blames John Cena Though the story goes that it was Randy Orton who ultimately got Mr. Kennedy delisted from WWE, the man himself puts the blame squarely on the broad shoulders of John Cena. The Viper was furious when Kennedy dropped him headfirst onto the canvas with a ropey-looking backdrop during their 25th of May 2009 contest but he knew he'd have a better shot of recompense if his complaint was delivered to locker room leader Cena. When Orton informed him of the mistake, John became kingmaker. He could have let the incident slide and reiterated that accidents happen. That's wrestling after all. Instead, he marched straight to Vince McMahon's office to dob on the apparently dangerous worker. Kennedy was released shortly after, calling his dismissal a hit job. I think Cena had a hand in that, he told Pro Wrestling Report. I didn't get along with him too well. Clearly. Number 8. Jean-Pierre Lafitte Blames the Click Pierre Carl Houlet might have enjoyed his best years at the very tail end of his career as an indestructible glutton for punishment, but they could have come a whole hell of a lot earlier had it not been for the predictable intervention of, yes, you guessed it, the click. Admittedly, probably not, given his WWE singles run saw him dossing about as an actual pirate following the dissolution of the Quebecers, but nevertheless, any chance of Ule's deserving talent accomplishing greater things were squashed beneath the big legs of the click's biggest man. At a September 1995 house show in his hometown of Montreal, Ule was booked to go to a non-finish with WWE champion Diesel, enabling a money-spinning rematch down the line. And that's what happened, but not before Shawn Michaels' politic to having the finish changed to a clean Diesel win. Ule simply refused to comply, and instead forced a double countout, and that was more or less the end of his WWE career. He left the company soon after. Number 7. Vader Blames Shawn Michaels Ever seen that remarkable wildlife footage of a group of lionesses teaming up to hunt down a seemingly untoppable elephant? That's the same number the click performed on bona fide superstar Vader in 1996. The humility that arrives with the prospect of death meant a reflective Vader eventually became inclined to blame himself for his WWE failure. But the fact is, whether he rebranded himself as the Mastodon or not, his cause was in no way helped by the negative interference of Shawn Michaels and his backstage buddies. It's no secret that Vader was a hard-hitting worker, but he hit just a little too hard for Shawn Michaels. After a house show in Tulsa, the heartbreak kid let everybody know his opinions on Big 
big van stiff style, letting on that if the big man yanked his hair again, it'd cost him his job. The enmity was there for all to see during Michael's unprofessional performance at SummerSlam 96, where the two collided for the top strap. When Vader botched an elbow drop spot, HBK threw an actual tantrum before giving him a kick for good measure. That moment sealed Vader's fate in WWE. The Lions had sadly dragged their mastodon down. Number 6. Alex Riley Blames John Cena For years, rumors persisted that Alex Riley's slide down the pecking order from promising NXT talent to underutilized commentator owed a lot to the backstage opinions of a certain John Cena. Such rumors were given considerable fillet when Tyler Rex endorsed them wholesale during a Reddit AMA following his own WWE departure. Rex revealed that everybody on the roster thought Cena was treating Riley in a way that was totally uncalled for. He was looking for a reason to get him fired, apparently. Riley, still under WWE employ at the time, stayed strictly silent on the claims, not wanting to compromise his already limited opportunities any further. Earlier this year, however, some time removed from the end of his tenure with the company, he finally lifted the lid on the subject. Right from the start, he didn't like me, Riley told Chris Van Vliet. It kinda got to the point where even some of the other guys would kinda be like, what's up with that? Nevertheless, he's philosophical about the situation. I'm not holding any grudges or anything like that. I certainly don't want it hanging over my neck for the rest of my life. Good for him. Number 5. Eli Drake Blames Bill DeMott Eli Drake, the namer of dummies, lived up to his nickname when, during a podcast with X-Pac, he put the burn on former NXT trainer Bill DeMott for his performance center tenure coming to a premature end. The future Impact and NWA man was part of a clutch of hopefuls drafted into the evolving NXT training program in 2013, when he was given the very typical full sale name, Slate Randall. However, his time in Florida was cut short after a year. It wasn't a lack of talent, but friction with head coach DeMott, which Drake cites as being partially responsible for losing him his job. He and I did not get along, he told Waltman before sarcastically adding, What a surprise, everybody. This just in, Bill DeMott didn't get along with somebody. Though Drake is convinced the former Hugh Morris had a hand in his less-than-hilarious departure, he admitted that, at the end of the day, it falls on me. Number 4. Buff Bagwell Blames Jim Ross A match with Booker T designed to test the waters of a possible Nitro revival was met with such an atrocious response that Vince McMahon practically lost interest in the evasion angle altogether. Stories then surfaced that Bagwell had faked an injury to skip SmackDown tapings, and had implored his mother call the office to complain about his travel schedule. Within a month of signing, the American Mail was out the door. Bagwell himself told a different version of events. Do you really believe that you're gonna fire Buff Bagwell over one bad match, he quizzed Wrestling Inc. Do people really believe that I have my mother call and say let him off Augusta in Birmingham? Well, F no, that's not true. Buff then placed the source of such malicious rumors at the feet of WWE's former head of talent relations, Jim Ross. The true, true story is Jim Ross created that monster and people believed it. He raged. Rightio then. Number 3. Raven Blames Shane McMahon Before he was a grunge-tastic denim cut-off enthusiast, spouting nihilistic nonsense from the corner of a ring, Scott Raven Levy portrayed the minted Johnny Polo. Even before finding his true place in the industry, Levy was a chameleon, and he slipped into his character convincingly. It probably helped that he'd spent much of 1994 shadowing an actual overprivileged prep who just so happened to be his boss's son, Shane McMahon. Unfortunately, he shadowed him a little too closely. The pair of 20-somethings quickly earned a reputation for their revelry. As you might reasonably imagine, getting the Chiefs' kid blathered every night had a detrimental effect on Levy's career. My downfall was I'd bring Shane out with me, he revealed on a Talk Is Jericho podcast some years back. A plastered junior would ape Levy's habit of calling Vince Vic on commentary during drunken late phone calls. Before announcing he wasn't coming home that night or morning, he'd say, Hey Vic, and it would be like 4 in the morning, I'm just going to sleep at Johnny Polo's tonight and so I just buried myself. When Levy returned to WWE at the end of the millennium under his Raven guys, Vince was heard to say, Who the F hired Johnny Polo? It's not known whether 30-year-old Shane still needed his dad's permission for a night out at this time. Number 2. Abraham Washington Blames Linda McMahon 
Former primetime players manager Abraham Washington initially placed the blame for his WWE firing on Linda McMahon and her campaign to become Connecticut State Senator. As Linda was making her political tilt in August 2012, WWE began clamping down on controversial content within their product, in a bid to ensure her opponents had as little ammunition for smears as possible. It was around this time Washington made an extremely ill-judged on-air quip regarding Kobe Bryant's impending sexual assault case. Eleven days later, he was sent his P45. Outraged, he then took to Twitter to blame his dismissal on Linda's campaign, writing, Creates jobs my ass. I'm fired thanks to you and your campaign. However, deep down, Washington knew the mistake had been his own and seven years after his firing told Wrestling Inc, I've since apologized to WWE and I've put it all behind me. Number 1. Bam Bam Bigelow Blames the Click The last of a quartet of click targets, the fire-headed Bam Bam Bigelow was similarly inflamed by the backstage burns of Shawn Michaels and Co. After lying down for pro footballer Lawrence Taylor at WrestleMania 11, Bigelow was expecting to be in receipt of a big babyface push as recompense for his character-damaging professionalism. It never transpired, and the click were largely behind that. In a 2007 shoot interview, the Beast from the East spoke of how the click's strength in numbers led to them telling Vince McMahon what to do. He went on to describe their locker room dominance as a terrible, terrible time which hurt a lot of people himself included. And that's our list. Know of any other wrestlers who blame others for failing in WWE? Let us know all about them in the comments section right down below and do not forget to like, share and click on that subscribe button. Also, be sure to head on over to whatculture.com and click on some more brilliant articles just like the one this video is based on. I've been Gareth from WhatCulture Wrestling, thank you very much for watching today and I'm sure I'll see you very, very soon.